Hey there YouTube, Wrestling Optimus here, back with my review of AEW and New Japan Forbidden Door. We're going to be doing things a little bit different for today's review. Instead of posing my action figures for elaborate pictures, I'm just going to kind of display them in the ring here while I talk about the matches. Sorry this is going out so late, I work on weekends, and I was having technical difficulties the night of the pay-per-view. But either way, we're here now, so let's take it over to the action figures. We start with the Zero Hour pre-show, hosted by Rene Paquette and RJ City. The whole stage was very elaborate and gave me New Japan pay-per-view vibes, especially when it came to the entrances and all the multi-man matches. Speaking of which, we start off with an 8-man tag team match between Chaos, made up of Best Friends, Rocky Romero, and El Desperado, versus Mogul Embassy, which includes the Gates of Agony, Brian Cage, and Swerve Strickland. It's a fun little match, and eventually Mogul Embassy wins with a Swerve Stomp on Rocky Romero. Next up is Round 1 of the Women's Owen Hart Tournament featuring Ring of Honor Women's Champion Athena taking on Billy Starks, the 18-year-old prodigy. And after a surprisingly competitive match, predictably Athena wins, and she'll advance on to round two. Our third match features El Phantasmo versus Stu Grayson, who's no longer part of Dark Order and has instead joined the Righteous in Ring of Honor. The biggest thing I remember is that El Phantasmo had an amazing light-up jacket and eventually he wins with a DDT and a Styles Clash. Finally, because yes, there were four matches on the pre-show, we get a six-man tag team match between United Empire's Kyle Fletcher of Aussie Open, Jeff Cobb, and TJP, taking on Los Ingobernables de Japan's Bushi, Takashi, and Shingo Takagi. Despite United Empire getting a lot of TV time with AEW recently, LIJ comes out victorious as Shingo Takagi hits TJP with a Made in Japan for the victory. Now on to the main card, where I noticed that commentary was at ringside for a change, which is a big positive, and there's a Japanese announce crew. Plus, in addition to Justin Roberts, we get a Japanese ring announcer. And the entire pay-per-view takes place in Toronto, so there's a ton of Canadian references. Just as he demanded, our opening match is MJF vs Hiroshi Tanahashi for the AEW World Championship. Hilariously, MJF's entrance gear says New Japan is an indie. Surprisingly, there's dueling chants for both men. At one point, MJF tries to walk out, but Tanahashi starts a coward chant, forcing MJF to come back where he does a fake handshake, but Tanahashi sees it coming and slaps him across the face. Meanwhile, there's lots of heel shenanigans by MJF, including a ref distraction that leads to a visual pinfall by Tanahashi. Then, another ref distraction allows MJF to hit Tanahashi with the dynamite diamond ring for the win. Next is round one of the Men's Owen Hart Tournament, as CM Punk takes on Satoshi Kojima. There's a very mixed reaction for Punk, leaning heavily towards booing. And the crowd reaction is basically the entire story of this match. Punk plays into it hard though, not wrestling like a heel, just taunting the crowd like one. He also uses a lot of other wrestlers' moves, especially Japanese wrestlers, including Kojima's tag partner, just to mock Kojima and give the smart fans something to cheer. They respond with chants of, Pepsi sucks, amongst others. Kojima manages to counter two GTSs, but can't counter the third, as Punk advances after a really fun match. We also get a great show of respect by Punk as he helps Kojima off the mat afterwards. The second championship is on the line as we get a four-way match for the AEW International title between current champion Orange Cassidy, the New Japan TV champion Zack Sabre Jr., the Ring of Honor Pure Champion, Katsuyuri Shibata, and the only non-champion, Daniel Garcia. It's really cool seeing champions from three separate promotions competing in one match. And as you would expect from these guys, there's a ton of fun spots throughout, including a four-way super kick, lots of slap fights, and double submissions. Of course, we get lots of intricate catch wrestling from Zack Sabre Jr., before Daniel Garcia hits a tombstone on him, Shibata hits a PK on Garcia, Orange Cassidy throws Shibata out of the ring, and rolls up Garcia for the win. 
Afterwards, Zack Sabre Jr. tells Cassidy, we're not done, then Orange and Shibata shake hands. The IWGP Heavyweight Championship is on the line next as Sonata defends against Jungle Boy Jack Perry. For some reason, Hook accompanies Jungle Boy to the ring, and we get Red Shoes, the best referee in all of New Japan. Nobody expected Jungle Boy to come out on top here, but he still put up one heck of a fight as Sonata wins with a moonsault after a nice competitive match. However, the real story happened post-match, as a defeated Jungle Boy and Hook walk up the ramp only for Jungle Boy to turn around and clothesline his best friend. He mocks the fans who wave to his theme song, and they respond with chants of, You fucked up! Taz agrees, saying Jungle Boy is a dead man, as the now, I would assume, just Jack Perry holds up the FTW title. The inevitable joke online is now that he's turned heel, he truly has become a jungle man. It's time for 10-man tag team action, as Eddie Kingston, Ishii, Hangman Adam Page, and the Young Bucks take on the Blackpool Combat Club, Takeshita, and Shota Umino. Keeping with the theme of the night, the BCC comes out to Moxley's New Japan music. Then we're treated to a match with all kinds of interwoven stories. Chief amongst them is Eddie Kingston getting his hands on arch rival Claudio Castagnoli. But first, he has to square off against his former best friend, John Moxley. They have a stereotypical face-off and exchange of chops that keeps going even as everything breaks down around them. We also get some classic Japanese strong style as Takeshita and Ishii square off, although I bet Jim Cornette hated that part. Technically, Eddie Kingston did get his hands on Claudio, but he was so beat up by that point that I don't think he got the revenge he was looking for. And of course, there were a bunch of fun Young Bucks spots, although Hangman's stuff is kind of getting old to me. Surprisingly, in the end, Ishii beats Wheeler Yuta with a stalling brain buster to get the victory for his team. Unfortunately, AEW continues its tradition of only having one women's match on the main card, as Tony Storm defends her AEW women's title against New Japan Strong Women's Champion Willow Nightingale. Willow holds her own through a bunch of interference by the outcasts until Ruby Soho and Soraya are eventually kicked out from ringside. Tony pulls the ref in the way so she can gouge Willow's eye behind his back, then she hits the Storm Zero to get the tainted victory. Meanwhile, Sky Blue and Britt Baker watch on disapprovingly from the back. Despite being third from last, our next contest is widely being hailed as Match of the Night, and a possible Match of the Year contender, as Kenny Omega takes on Will Ospreay for the IWGP United States title in the second of what will inevitably be a trilogy of matches. Recently, Kenny's former mentor Don Callis has taken a liking to Will Ospreay, and he brings security out to the ring before getting ejected. My one big criticism of this match is that later on, Don Callis comes back out and it doesn't result in a disqualification. However, he has tons of heat with the crowd, and that almost makes up for it. At one point, Will Ospreay steals a Canadian flag from a fan and wipes his crotch with it, then picks his nose before he gets clotheslined. After having the advantage for most of the fight, Osprey hits a one-winged angel, but Kenny kicks out at one. But Omega's comeback isn't enough as Osprey hits a back elbow strike and the Stormbreaker to become the new IWGP United States Champion. Don't get me wrong, I understand why this is a modern wrestling fan's dream match, and I appreciate why it's considered so good. However, this style just isn't for me personally. So hate on me in the comments all you want, but spoiler alert, I thought the main event was match of the night. But before we get to that, we still have a six-man tag team match between La Suzuki gods of Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, and Minoru Suzuki taking on Darby Allin, Sting, and Tetsuya Naito. Naito starts off doing his classic tranquilo shtick, even doing the pose. Then, when Minoru Suzuki enters the match, he gets Murder Grandpa chants from the crowd. He goes to square off with Sting, but Jericho demands the tag so that he can have his first ever in-ring face-to-face -face with the Stinger. Eventually, we get a triple submission hold, then a ridiculous flip onto Sting through a table by Sammy Guevara, which he was suspiciously told to do by Jericho. 
Darby Allin continues to prove why he should be the only person in wrestling allowed to do suicide dives, but he's eventually taken out by a Judas effect, so Sting and Naito have to team up on Suzuki in order to get the win. In the post-match, Jericho attacks Naito, but Sting fights him off with his bat. Finally, in the main event, the only title on the line is Best Wrestler in the World, as the American Dragon, Daniel Bryan, takes on the Rainmaker, Kazuchika Okada. First, let's get this out of the way, the final countdown entrance music is back for Daniel Bryan. Don't get me wrong, Okada's entrance was legendary too, but having the American Dragon's indie theme back popped all the marks hard. Just wow. This turned out to be one of those matches so epic it gets This Is Awesome chants before the two competitors even lock up. In a similar way to Omega vs. Osprey earlier in the night, this is a dream match for pro wrestling fans. Each man played the hits, so if you've seen their other matches, you can probably tell how this went without the play-by-play. -play. Either way, it was over 20 minutes of two masters of their craft. Danielson legitimately injured his arm which played into the ending, but before that he did a worked injury spot faking convulsions on the ground before dodging a Rainmaker and hitting Okada with a knee. Then, impressively, Danielson manages to lock in a submission using his legs instead of the injured arm, and force the tap out to officially earn the title of Best Wrestler on the Planet. Overall, I thought this was a fantastic pay-per-view possibly my favorite of the entire year so far. I absolutely loved the integration of New Japan into AEW, utilizing their wrestlers and traditions. Not to mention the wrestling was solid throughout. It was really long though, and a lot of this stuff felt like it could have been cut and put on an episode of Rampage, Dynamite, or even Collision now. But it's not every day that you get to put together an entire card of dream matches, so I understand. And if I had to give it a grade, depending on your scale, it's either 5 stars, A, or 9 out of 10. And that's gonna do it for my action figure review of AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling's Forbidden Door 2023. Let me know what you thought of the pay-per-view down there in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to do all that normal YouTube stuff. Smash the like button, share with any wrestling or action figure fans you may know, subscribe to the channel, and spread the word. You can also talk to me over on Twitter at WrestlingOptimus, or see all my best figure photography over on Instagram at WrestlingOptimus. If you haven't seen my latest video, it should be on screen now. But until next time, I've been Wrestling Optimus, and I'll catch you later.